So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So uh, th there is perhaps no other ancient Greek philosopher that has eluded uh, our full understanding more than, well, <laughs> Pythagoras, uh, who lived between 582 to 507 BCE. It's not because we have so little information, but we have uh, so much concerning his themes and ideas from a whole bunch of sources, but they don't necessarily agree. <laughs> so accordingly, uh, Pythagoras was both a philosopher and a mystic, uh, teaching reincarnation and mathematics, ethics, and teaching about the soul. Uh, for him, of course, the soul was divided between good and evil. For him, uh, there was also this idea of the harmony of the stars, where planets uh, and stars moved according to exact mathematical equations, which uh, he believed uh, corresponded to musical notes, and so created this celestial symphony. He was a man of that was deeply involved in the mysteries. We're going to have so many mysteries here. Uh, it's going to be ridiculous. Uh, he was initiated into many of them, and he adopted a belief system that is known as Orphism, which we'll delve into a little bit. But he also taught a deep and mystical kind of knowledge. Uh, he was a vegetarian, according to some sources, others not, so we'll go into that in a little bit, but uh, he taught how we as humans need to be kind and, and loving to animals and, and respect nature. Pythagoras created an exclusive society, very exclusive, where many revered him as a god, but he was also all about inclusion and equality, uh, which idealized the inclusion, especially of women, as full equals. As a result, Pythagoras started a female movement of philosophers throughout antiquity uh, that uh, most have never heard of before, and including his wife, Theano, uh, his daughters, Damo and Mia, and then moving on to uh, Erignote and Abrotilia and Aesara of Lucinia and Finces and Timica of Sparta, and Melissa, and Ptolemaeus of Cyrene. I mean, <laughs> who knew? Uh, most people don't know. So we're going to investigate this. Now, what I did, um, I, I have been immersed uh, in, in uh, primary sources as well as secondary sources uh, all my life. And what I did with this talk is I wanted the ancient perspective of Pythagoras. I want you to understand how people at that time, uh, from his time all the way uh, to around the, the fourth, actually fifth century CE, I want you to understand how uh, he was perceived by the Greeks and the Romans. I want you to get into their worldview. So what I did is I decided, just for fun, uh, to exclude many secondary sources and just went through the primary sources and put this together like a patchwork quilt because I want you to understand how they understood him. And maybe that's going to help. Now, I did throw in uh, towards the end a little bit of commentary to mathematics, but uh, uh, that's put together in more recent times. But most of this is from that era. So let's jump into this, shall we? Now, while Pythagoras was a noted pre-Socratic philosopher, we must keep in mind that he was also very much a mystic too. And so very much represents the realm between uh, science and religion wrapped up in his own person. Pythagoras was born on the island of Samos off the coast of Ionia and directly across from the city of Ephesus. Um, so uh, Margie, let's take a look at Samos, uh, shall we? So he grew up here. Of course, this region is directly connected uh, to the 
uh, birth a Greek philosophy. This is a great image of Pythagoras. That's a great one. Let's take a look at the next one. That's great. And then we see, I, I love this uh, artistic one. This is showing him uh, connected to his uh, the, the famous, of course, uh, the shapes and sizes and so forth and music and rhythm and harmony. Uh, let's go to the next one. The next one will be a Samos itself. You know what they did? Those, those people of Samos, they put up this giant statue of Pythagoras. <laughs> so they're proud of him. Uh, let's go to the next picture. Uh, and of course, these are the next one are the so-called grotto of Pythagoras, where it's claimed that he spent much of his time. Uh, it's pretty steep here. And the next picture, I think, is a close-up uh, of, well, not very close at all. Uh, of the face of Pythagoras on that more contemporary statue. Uh, thank you so much, Margie, for showing that. Okay, so so we'll continue here. Uh, so, of course, this region of Samos is directly connected uh, to the birth of Greek philosophy. Uh, in, in fact, uh, which is so fascinating because Greek philosophy did not start in mainland Greece. <laughs> it didn't. It started in the area of Ionia. It started in the area of Asia Minor, which is now Turkey today. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, you have a few reasons why. Uh, one of the reasons why is that uh, these this area is there's a connected connection directly with the trade routes. Uh, that uh, all went all the way to Persia, as well as India, and of course the sea routes went all the way to Egypt. And so this interaction with different cultures and different ideas and uh, and beliefs and perspectives, that's how philosophy thrives. You have in mainland Greece, you have the situation where you know uh, people are living uh, in between these steep mountains in virtual isolation of one another. And of course, this does foster the city-state system, a really uh, a strong sense of independence between them. And yes, later on, they will foster great philosophers, but at first, it really doesn't help. But when the Greeks set along the coast of Ionia, oh, well then, uh, you have this these, these river valleys that go all the way up a, uh, around Asia Minor, all the way up into the the plateau of Anatolia, and so and you have these roads that go east and west, and that facilitates all these ideas. And these ideas then go to a place called Miletus, which is right along the coast of uh, of Ionia. And Miletus, of course, you got Thales, right, who's the first pre-Socratic philosopher. You have Anaximander, right, after him, also from Miletus, and then you have Axemenes, also from Miletus. And then, of course, uh, you move on to, well, obviously, Heraclitus of Ephesus, which is just up north from Miletus. Well, right across the way uh, from Ephesus, then, is the island of Samos. So it's still part of this area, the great royal road of the Persians uh, that uh, went uh, from Ephesus all the way uh, to uh, Susa and Persepolis after that. And there was like a 111 postal stations in between it. So it took about two weeks to get from Ephesus, which is along the Aegean, uh, to, uh, to Persia, pretty deep in. It only took two weeks. <laughs> so, so information spread so fast and samos was one of those areas to receive all this interesting information and this is where pythagoras grew up it makes sense you know he's at the right place at the right time right in the middle of this great explosion of knowledge that's known as the axial age right i mean fact I, you'll figure out pretty quickly during this period of time, I mean, between you know six to five hundred BC, not only are these uh, the pre-Socratic philosophers, you know, you know, six, five hundred, four hundred, the pre-Socratic philosophers are thriving in, in of course, Ionia. But you go further in, and of course, and Zoroastrianism is really spreading quickly, right? And of course, you have also the newer ideas 
arriving uh, in the, uh, the Babylonian exile, a new form of Judaism is, is, is arising. But you go further east, and what's happening during that period of time of the 500s? Well, of course, you have now Hinduism becoming fully autonomous uh, from Brahmanism. And also from Brahmanism, you have, of course, Buddha is in the 500s, right? So he's coming about uh, during the same five, uh, the same era. And also uh, you have Mahavira, right? <laughs> you know, of Jainism during that same era. And you go further and further east and it's like, whoa, 500s, wait, <laughs> you got, you got Confucius, right? During the same period of time. You know, and Lao Tzu, so Confucianism, and 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 so this is a pretty amazing, right? This is the axial age. So ideas are going from east to west, and Pythagoras is going to receive many of these ideas. So we're going to go into how that happened. So Samos, which is an island right off the coast, is receiving all this information from the trade routes, and also coming by way of Egypt. And we'll find out really soon that he does go to Egypt twice. Okay, so Pythagoras, as I said, was born on Samos. According to Diogenes Laertes, and we're going to be talking about Diogenes quite often. He's a, he's a primary, well, he's not primary source, but he is a uh, he has an ancient source on it, right? Uh, Pythagoras was the son of a gem engraver by the name of Mensarchus. And according to Hermippus, uh, a Samian, he had brothers of, of whom Eunomus was the elder and Tyrannus was the second. He also had a slave. Uh, the slave was named Zamalchus. Now, <laughs> you're going, why are you talking about this? So he has a slave named Zamalchus. Already the mysteries begin. With the slave named Zabalkis? Well, of course, according to Di, uh, Diogenes Laertius, uh, he was, uh, it says, who also had a slave, uh, Zabalkis, who was worshipped by the Gitans as Kronos. And by the way, Herodotus mentions that as well. In fact, Zabalkis is part of this mystery, <laughs> this mysterious slave. Uh, is part of the whole story of Pythagoras at the beginning. Uh, he's mentioned by Herodotus and Jordans and Iamblichus and Plato. Everybody talks about him, but uh, not us today. So according to Herodotus, Zomalchus, uh, he was a human. <laughs> You're going, why do you define him as a human? Is this, this is going to change? Uh-huh. So he, he was a human. He was at first a, a slave of Pythagoras. He had, was inducted into the Lusian Mysteries. He was then liberated and went back to his homeland uh, in Thrace. And he was amongst a fierce group known as the Gite. Uh, there, for some reason, uh, he taught those in Thrace that they would go to a place where death is unknown. What? So this, maybe everybody's inspired by Pythagoras. I don't know what happens here, but the slave is now telling these people, the Gite, that uh, there is this place uh, that uh, you eludes death and you can achieve immortality. So then he, uh, this, he dug this underground home. <laughs> Just can't make this up. And he lived there in this underground home for three years, returning on the fourth year. And now the Gite believe, wow, uh, yeah, he's, he does, you know, he's come back. <laughs> he's in a sense resurrected. And so what happens is that uh, he's viewed then as a divine being uh, and synonymous with a God by the name of Gelbisus, who is the storm and lightning God, the sky God. <laughs> of, uh, uh, of of the Gite. Uh, and they, they do kind of rituals where they shoot these arrows into the air. Many people believe this is a pre-Indo-European belief system that's reasserting itself. Uh, it's funny uh, because Iamblichus, the famous Neoplaton uh, philosopher, says that uh, by, the, by the Thrace, he was considered the greatest of the gods by the Gite. Plato 
Plato uh, says he was skilled in the art of incantation. So I don't know. I mean, we just started talking about the Pythagoras and all of a sudden, you know, just even a slave suddenly goes off and becomes a divine being. <laughs> you just can't make this up. I mean, you can make this up and it most likely is made up. But the point of the matter is, this is what people believed in that time. So, so is <laughs> the legacy already of Pythagoras. We just started his life. Let's keep going. So, now let's go into, so as the origins of Pythagoras's name, Pythagoras, his name is connected to Pythia, Pythia, in relation to the Pythian Apollo. Uh, Aristippus, uh, who lived from 435 to 356 BCE, I told you I'm using primary sources, writes, he spoke, Agor, the truth no less than the Pythian, unquote. So he's being connected to the Pythia. He's like a Pythia from the mindset of those in ancient times. In fact, Iamblichus claims that the Pythia of Apollo made a prophecy telling his mother that she would give birth to a man who was beautiful, who was wise, and who would offer special gifts to humanity. Another source asserts that his mother's name was Pythias, and so perhaps was named after her. So uh, who are the Pythia? I'll give you a little background since those in ancient times see him as a male version of a Pythia. So, and it's connected to his name. I just gave you the source so you could, you know. Uh, the Pythia, um, this is a name bestowed upon the priestess of Delphi, a sanctuary that was dedicated to Apollo that was located beneath the slopes of Mount Parnassus. So uh, Margie, go ahead and show us a uh, beautiful uh, Delphi there. What happened is, is that according, accordingly, the Pythia entered into a mystical trance and then worked into a frenzy and would become possessed by the prophetic spirit and deliver various oracles, often in gibberish, but then interpreted by the priest standing by. Some of the prophecies being well, quite enigmatic and sometimes downright confounding. <laughs> Go to the next picture. Uh, for example, one time King Croesus of Lydia wanted to know what to do with the approach of the Persians. Should he keep his plan of attack? Uh, sending his question to the Oracle of Delphi, the Pythia responded that if he should attack, a great empire would fall. <laughs> filled with hope croesus did attack and indeed an empire did fall his own <laughs> investigating uh, the geology about the area scientists have confirmed that there are indeed gas emissions arising from where the pythia sat that could induce one to enter into a trance-like state the pythia had to be a virgin and serve for life with the next pythia taking her place only after she died. Thank you, Margie, so much. Now, Pythagoras uh, came from a family uh, of some means, enabling him to travel extensively about the Eastern Mediterranean many different times. Pythagoras was not poor, but had the advantages of, of arriving from a wealthier background, and so he didn't have to be in constant survival mode. It kind of freed him up to just simply explore philosophy as a full-time occupation. Isn't that special? <laughs> I wish I could do that, right? Don't we all? Wouldn't it be nice to just, hey, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to be a philosopher, sure. You know, not worry about it. So there you have it. So during uh, the first notable trip, Pythagoras left Samos for uh, the nearby island of Lesbos, uh, located further to the north along the coast of Asia Minor, accompanied by his own personal slaves. So once again, uh, uh, we have evidence here uh, that uh, Zimalchus went with him on this trip. 
I'm not sure if that's any influence about Zomalkis later on becoming this divine being. I don't know, but uh, we shall go into this. Uh, we're going to go into another rabbit trail. Here we go. So, so what happens is that from Samos, I'm reading the primary source now. Uh, it is said he went to Lesbos with an introduction to uh, Ferris. Pherecides. Now, Pherecides, uh, from his uncle Zolius, Pherecides. Pherecides is, actually, he becomes one of the teachers of Pythagoras, although some people say that Pythagoras influenced him, but he, theoretically, he's one of the teachers. And we're going to go into the rabbit hole right now. While there are many teachers ascribed to Pythagoras, some possible, others highly improbable it is highly likely that uh that pharisides uh was one of his uh teachers uh first of all pharisides uh was very much into the mysteries especially espousing ways of trying to access hidden knowledge uh creating a very esoteric school of thought uh, one commentary declared of him it says Parasitides, the man of Cyrus, talks of recesses and pits and caves and doors and gates, and through these speaks in riddles of becomings and the deceasings of the soul. Ooh. <laughs> Second uh, reason why uh, Pharisides is most likely connected to Pythagoras, other than people saying that he was an instructor. Both Cicero and Augustine agree that that Pharisides was one of the earliest to teach about the idea of the immortality of the soul, at least uh, to the Greeks. So, and we know that uh, Pythagoras later on teaches about the immortality of the soul. And tied to this thought, third. Um, Pherecydides taught the idea of the transmigration of souls, or as we commonly call it, reincarnation. Now, once again, <laughs> Lesbos is right there, Samos right there along the coast of Ionia. With the idea of reincarnation, absolutely, 100% becomes part of the Greek and Roman mindset. Plato talks about it. Of course, later on, Virgil and the Aeneid talk about it. It's common knowledge. Where does it enter? Here, during the axial age, during the period of time where reincarnation starts becoming a really big idea in places like India, right? Uh, when um, when you have Brahmanism uh, slowly transferring into a form of uh, will become Hinduism, uh, and, and so so you have this this change in the Upanishads, especially. The Brahmanas start going there. The Upanishads go there. And this is, of course, from the 500s. So, and this is the transformation. So these ideas seem to be crossing across uh, the continent. Fourth, uh, like Pythagoras, some considered um, uh, Pherecydides a philosopher, but others as a religious figure or a theologian, uh, like Plutarch uh, believes in his parallel lives. Fifth. Pherecydides reveals much evidence that he was deeply involved in the Orphic mysteries. And we know, of course, that Pythagoras was involved in those two. So not only do we have the testimony that they were that they had this relationship, uh, but we also have the connection that even the content of what they taught were similar, if not the same. And so that means many of the ideas that we know of uh, Pharisaeides is are the ideas, and they are, uh, we'll see later on, will become the ideas of Pythagoras. Now I want to bring up a little bit more about the mysteries of this teacher of Pythagoras that will influence and be part of the idea uh, ideas of Pythagoras. Pharisaeides principal work was entitled uh basically translates as five pente recesses mucus. Yeah, five recesses, the five recesses, which can also translate as the five nooks or crannies or 
or sanctuaries or even altars. Now, for here we go, and this is this will be part of also the ideas of Pythagoras. Pherosinides teaches that there are three divine principles. Three divine principles. You have that which is Zas, which is, of course, Zeus. It's called Zas. You have Kathoni, Kathoni, which, of course, translates as Earth. So you have Zeus, you have Earth, and you have Kranas, which means time. And that these three divine principles always existed. Now, Zas or Zeus or sky, right? was obviously the initiating creative principle. In fact, uh, Proclus will state that Pherosinides used to say that Zeus changed into Eros, which of course is love, passionate love, when about to create. For the reason that having created the world from opposites, he led it into agreement and peace and sowed sameness in all things, and unity that interpenetrates the entire universe. So Zeus, this divine principle, becomes Eros, initiating the creation of the universe uh, through his masculine uh, sexual activity, which has obvious parallels, as we know, uh, to Zeus of the Orphic Mysteries, as we shall discover quite soon. This uh, creative masculine initiating is upon the feminine Cthoni, or Earth. This moment of union is described as, <laughs> this is really colorful, it's described as Zeus making a cloth with Earth and sea upon it, and then wrapping this material he fashioned around Cthoni as his wedding gift. <laughs> I'll read it again. Let's try that. Zeus making a cloth uh, consisting with earth and sea and upon it. Uh, it's upon it. And then wrapping this material he fashioned around Cthoni as his wedding gift. So she's given uh, this wedding dress, <laughs> this wedding outfit that is uh, earth and sea. In another fragment uh, from uh, Parasites, Zeus wraps the cloth around a, wing, a winged oak, a, a oak tree, a winged. So an oak tree has wings on it. Oh, and, you know, now that in and of itself is a whole other talk when it comes to sacred trees. It's like, wait a second, why is the oak tree, oh, that's sacred to Zeus, has wings connected to the sky, but what's going on there? Oh, well, I wish I had time to unpack it, but we have more things to, to unwrap. So according to, according to Pherosinides, uh, what happens now, and which of course is part connected to aspects of the Orphic Mysteries, and of course we are still talking about Pythagoras. This, this is the worldview that Pythagoras is now being introduced to and will participate in. There is a battle then follows between Kranas, you know, which is time, and one known as Ophian, also known as um, Ophionius. Ophian, Ophionius. Are you ready for more mysteries? Ophian, Ophionius? I don't know who Ophian is. Okay, so <laughs> we're back to mysteries. So we, we, we were taught that you had, of course, Uranus, who is heaven. Uh, with Gaia, right? And then, of course, from this couple, we will eventually have the next major couple, and these are the Titans, and this is Kronos and Rhea, right? And then following Kronos and Rhea, uh, you have, of course, Zeus and Hera. So we're used to these pairs, Uranus and Gaia, Kronos and Rhea, Zeus and Hera. Did you know, and you may didn't, you may not have known, that there is another secret union, another secret pair that is between Uranus and Gaia and Kronos and Rhea. 
<laughs> what? Yeah, there's a there's a mysterious couple in between. Uh, <laughs> so you can and that's Ophian and Uranomi. So it really is then Uranus and Gaia, the first pair, and then it is Orpheon and Uranomi, and that pair, and then it's Kronos and Rhea, and then Zeus and Hera. Wait, how come I never knew this? Because these are part of the shh mysteries. You see, Uranus, of course, is the primordial god of the sky, right? With Gaia. And accordingly, um, Uranus or Uranus, right, uh, is the is the father of Ophian, and Ophian uh, is the brother of Kronos. And at first, it is Ophian and his consort, Uranomi, who are the ones who are the rulers. And let's go further. Ready? And he is the primordial serpentine god. The primordial serpentine god. He is, the, in fact, the word uh, uh, Ophian uh, means serpent. Uh, so according to, wow, <laughs> we went there. So wait, so we went from this heaven deity to a short period of time where you have this serpent deity that's in charge yeah and on mount olympus too and then and then of course Cronus takes over is this interesting right this is part of these inner mysteries i told you i'm going to share you things that nobody ever heard of before or most people haven't heard so what will happen there of course there's a shadow of that with typhon of course typhon uh is from gaia and tartarus but there is a shadow of that idea of that tradition that kind of echoes in that legend so what happens now, I'm going to basically, I'm going to just read a primary source to explain it all. Uh, why not? This belief. So it goes as follows. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so uh, according to Apollonius of Rhodes, I'm just going to read you the source. Yeah. Uh, the famed singer Orpheus sang of this battle that follows between Kronos, Time, and brother Ophian. As follows, he sang, I'm quoting now, I am quoting from the ancient source, he sang how the earth and the heaven and the sea once mingled together under one form, how after deadly strife were separated each from the other, and how the stars and the moon and the paths of the sun ever keep their fixed places in the sky, and how the mountains rose. And how the resounding rivers with their nymphs came into being and all creeping things. This is really the origin of all things. And he sings how first of all, Ophian and Uranomi, daughter of Oceanus, held the sway of snowy Olympus. And how through strength of arm, one yielded his prerogative to Kronos and the other to Rhea. So basically... Uh, how <laughs> Cronus and Rhea took over Olympus from Ophian and Uranomi. And how through that strength of arm, one yielded, uh, sorry, and how they fell into the waves of Oceanus. But the other two, meanwhile, ruled over the blessed Titan gods, while Zeus, uh, still a child, and with the thoughts of a child, dwelt at the Dictaean cave. Of course, that's Mount Ida, right? The Dictaean cave. And the earthborn Cyclopes had not yet armed him with the bolt, with thunder and lightning, for these things gave renown to Zeus. That's from the Argonautica. So, yeah. So, there is this conflict. Then there is chaos. And this is interpreted as water arising only after, uh, only a a after the first three. In the end, Cronus defeats... Uh, um, Ophian and his followers. Yes, we're going to go deeper. And locks the ladder away into Tartarus with locks fashioned of iron, understood by Pherecydes, you know, who's the teacher of Pythagoras, as an appointment 
of the spheres as an appointment by the spheres with both Zeus and Cronus victorious and now ruling the sky as well as all space and time. Meanwhile, Ophianus or Ophian is thrown into Oceanus. Now you're thinking, is this story? No. We're about to reveal something that goes into the deeper recesses of understanding of deities connected to the Minoans. Deities that were connected to Orphism that goes all the way back. Here we go. You ready? So what are the five recesses, you know, about, you know, that uh, that was talked about by Pherecydides? What are these, these five recesses uh, that, of course, will be learned by Pythagoras and part of the Pythagorean mysteries? Yes, we're revealing Pythagorean mysteries here. So, yeah, this is good, right? What happens here is, uh, well, there are various gods locked, or I should say goddesses, locked into these various resources behind these secret hidden caverns and doors. And of course, the first one, obviously, is Ophian, who we talked about. He's locked away. What about the second one? Well, the second one is his consort, Euronomi. So Euronomi is in the second out of the five recesses. Now, the name Euronomi is derived from a Proto-Indo-European word, nemein, which means to distribute. So for she was a ruler who is also known as a wanderer. In fact, we get the word nomad from her name. A wanderer. And so, so who is a wanderer that seems to also be one who distributes and orders things as she moves over places? Guess what that would be? That's the moon. That's right. <laughs> so, so most likely a Euronomi is connected to the idea of the moon. Now, Euronomi was, again, a pre-Indo-European Neolithic mother goddess with lunar associations that was overthrown by the Mycenaeans when they took over Greece, possibly in connection uh, to the Pelasians who occupied mainland Greece before their arrival. Uh, but, uh, you know, people forgot about her, but not... Uh, <laughs> No, no, not our friend, Pherecydides. He remembers, and of course, obviously, this goes into Pythagoras. Okay, so who is in the who is in the second chamber? Which well, guess what? Surprise, surprise, right? The one in the the, the second one happens to be um, um, Euchidna. Euchidna is another goddess, another goddess that's demoted, uh, that is thrown into the underworld. Uh, now, Euchidna means she-viper, the she-viper. She was half-nymph and half-snake, and often declared as the mother of all monsters. Euchidna was a dracana, was a dragon, having the face and torso, however, of a beautiful woman, but her body was that of a serpent, sometimes having two serpent tails. Now, which is interesting, right? So at one time, uh, Euchidna, or the Euchidae, I should say, the multiple, these multiple creatures were viewed as protectors of the vineyard. So they became demoted to these uh, creatures <clears throat> who were uh, protectors of the vineyards. Uh, we can see this uh, observed uh, from various images of now multiple versions of her on various archaic vases. One vase depicts uh, two uh, echidnine acting in magical ways within a vineyard, while the opposite side shows goats attacking the very same vines. Hesiod, uh, from the uh, around 600 BCE, notes of echidna, he, he says as follows, in a hollow cave, she bore another monster, irresistible, in no wise like either to mortal men or to the undying gods. 
Even the goddess fears Echidna, who is half nymph with glancing eyes and fair cheeks. And half again, a huge snake, great and awful, with speckled skin, eating raw flesh beneath the secret parts of the holy earth. And there she has a cave deep down under a hollow rock, far from the deathless gods and mortal men. There then did the gods appoint her glorious house to dwell in. And she keeps guard in Arima beneath the earth, grim Echidna, a nymph who dies not nor grows old all her days. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, all right. Who is under the, the fourth recess? Well, that's Kellere. Kellere, uh, it's a naiad whose name means beautiful flow. So why would she be sent there? Well, she's the one who produced Echidna, you know, so mom is locked away. Uh, okay, you can see where these Minoan goddesses, right, are being demoted into these hollows. Are you seeing this? But still, the, the, the mysteries, shh continue on as undercurrents uh, preserved in the Orphic realm of the mysteries. And then, of course, uh, continuing on with Pharisides and then into Pythagoras. I told you I'm going to reveal mysteries. <laughs> so, well, okay. So, <clears throat> um, moving on. Uh, now, uh, as for the fifth, scholars are divided. Many believe is Cthoni. Uh, who is, of course, Earth herself, locked away in one of these lowest chambers. Do you guys notice something? Yeah. Four out of the five of these deities that are placed into these hollows uh, deep within the Earth happen to be demoted goddesses. And you can see this is a very strong sign of a patriarchy. But then again, as we know about a lot uh, about uh, Pythagoras, uh, he sees women as equals. Now we're starting to understand where things are going. Okay, so there we have it. Now, now uh, Pherosonides, uh, he was either buried in the city of Ephesus or on the island of Delos. There's two different traditions about where he's buried. All right, so Pythagoras is now getting all this information, and I'm sure his slave, <laughs> who is with them, uh, is getting all these ideas too, because again, he's going to be freed and he's going to be coming to God. So another one who taught Pythagoras <clears throat> was a teacher by the name of uh, uh, Themistoclea. Uh, Themistoclea. Themistoclea was a priestess of Delphi. She was a priestess of Delphi. Wait. Dr. Reedfeld, we had another one of his teachers. It's it's a it's a it's a yes, yes. A a female mystic who is a priestess is one of his teachers. Good, right? And he and she is said to have taught him his moral doctrines, according to Aristarchus of Tarotin, in the fourth century, as quoted by Diogenes Laertes in the third century. Uh, now, Periphery, uh, who's, of course, a famous uh, Neoplatonist, called her Aristoclea and says the same. He, Pythagoras, taught much else, which he claimed to have learned from Aristoclea at Delphi. Because this fact goes against the common patriarchy of the era and uh, in view of Pythagoras's own later teachings that firmly asserts when uh uh, that uh, women can be philosophers, this attribution may indeed actually be very authentic. Uh, so this is kind of like, uh, yeah, here we go. Next, Pythagoras went to Egypt. Yeah, he went to Egypt. From there, he, he so what he did is that um, he went to Egypt, bringing with him expensive gifts. Uh, in fact, he had three silver flagons made and took them as presents to each of the priests of Egypt. And so they received these. Now, he may not have stayed long on this, this trip, and he may have realized uh, that he needed more than expensive gifts to satisfy the Egyptian priests, to open up their mysteries to just a mere foreigner, because he leaves 
and he comes back again another time. But this this time, uh, he will bear special papers to gain an audience with Pharaoh. From Egypt, Pythagoras go, goes back to Lesbos to return again uh, uh, to Pharisides. So again, um, until his death. Yeah, he's there until his death. So I, when, I, when I told you all about the Pharisides, that was important because Pythagoras was with him all the way until his death. And then he returned to Samos again. Uh, and he says, okay, I'll just quote here. Uh, he was a pupil, as already stated, of Pharisides of Cyrus, after whose death he went to Samos to be the pupil of Hermodamus, a man already advanced in years. Uh, many believe that Hermodamus was Pythagoras' music teacher. So this is where he's learning his music. Now Pythagoras was eager for knowledge. But not just any knowledge, but mystical and occult knowledge. Diogenes Laertes states, quote, while still young, so eager was he for knowledge, he left his own country and had himself initiated into all the mysteries and rites, not only of Greece, but also of foreign countries. So most likely during this time, Pythagoras was introduced, uh, I should say in induced into the Orphic Mysteries, although I think this happened already uh, with Pharisides, right? But uh, also the other mystery cults and belief systems uh, as well. Uh, moving on, apparently Pythagoras then embarked on even more extensive travels. Uh, he went from there uh, to Babylon, uh, and to Crete, it's not really that exotic, it's near, and to back to Egypt. He's back to Egypt again. We actually know much about his trip to Egypt. That's right. Um, but of course, uh, such a, a precedent was not unusual for the Greeks uh, who were merely on the northern side of the Mediterranean from them, with Plutarch noting, witness to this also are the wisest of the Greeks, Solon, Thales, Plato, Eudoxius, Pythagoras, who came to Egypt and consorted with the priests, unquote, from his Isis and Osiris work. <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, this is where wise people go in Greece. They go to Egypt. <clears throat> so many people miss this link. Of course, Pythagoras was, was prepared with the proper papers to present the Egyptian pharaoh. So we have that as... Um, as Polycrates sent him a letter of introduction uh, to Amasis. This is the pharaoh, Amasis, at his court at Areopolis. Now, Amasis II, the pharaoh, uh, he ruled uh, from 570 to 5, was like this, 570 to 526. He was also known as Atmos II. And he warmly received Pythagoras. He's very impressed with him and interested in everything they had to say and share. So Atmos II, uh, he happened to be a very unusual pharaoh. Uh, in fact, he did not come from a very long, proud line. Uh, he came from common origins. Uh, he gained power as a result of a revolt amongst Egyptian soldiers, returning home after a really disastrous defeat uh, against the uh, Dorians in Libya. Uh, so... <laughs> And so what happens, the previous pharaoh, a priest, fled to Babylon. Uh, so what happened, of course, is that uh, he's in control. So Abbos also wished to endear himself with the Greeks as much as possible. Still, he had a genuine interest in Greek culture, uh, sending generous gifts to many of the Greek holy sites, even helping rebuild the Temple of Apollo at Delphi after it burned down. After hearing Pythagoras, Pythagoras freely, this is a quote from ancient times, freely entered the Egyptian sanctuaries and was told their secret lore concerning the gods, unquote. For Ahmos II gave him the papers necessary to enter any of the temples of his land and meet with any of their priests. And of course, the four centers of the ancient knowledge being Heliopolis, Memphis, 
Hermopolis, and Thebes. Now, Plutarch <laughs> notes that Pythagoras first received instruction from Unephis of Heliopolis. However, there is a story uh, where none of the priests of Heliopolis, and Memphis, and Hermopolis, and Thebes who wish to give up their secrets to this uh, Greek stranger. <laughs> but they didn't want to look like they're going to be disobeying the Pharaoh either. So what they did is that when Pythagoras talked to the priests of Heliopolis, they told him that, oh, yeah, you know what? Uh, those at Memphis, they had by far the oldest and most authoritative tradition. So why don't you go to, to Memphis? So, so he goes to Memphis, and the priests of Memphis said, oh, you know what? Yeah. They were wrong. It's actually Thebes. They have the they have the little stronger tradition. So you should go there instead. And when Pythagoras reached Thebes, these priests realized <laughs> they better let him in. <laughs> They're running out of options. There's only one more city of the four. Uh, but they decided that we're gonna make we're gonna make the regiment so difficult for the initiation to, to find our mysteries that it's He's, he's going to give up. So they, they had these extreme fasts, uh, difficult feats of physical endurance, and constant study. Pythagoras prevailed, and they gave up. No other Greek had been initiated into the Egyptian priesthood before. Pythagoras also decided to um, stay a while <laughs> and be with these priests. We know that Pythagoras was there long enough so that according to Laertes, uh, quote, quote, he learned, this is a quote, he learned the Egyptian language. So he learned Egyptian. As he said, we learn from Antiphon in his book on men of outstanding merit. So he even, we have, Laertes even gives the source of where he heard the story. Plutarch uh, notes, uh, who's very involved with Egypt in general, if you know his works, but Thagoras, quote, it seems, was greatly admired, and he also greatly admired the Egyptian priests and copying their symbolism and occult teachings, I'm still quoting from ancient times, incorporated his doctrines, this is great, incorporated his doctrines in enigmas. As a matter of fact, I'm still quoting this, most of the Pythagorean precepts do not at all fall short of the writings that are called hieroglyphs, such, for example, as those do not eat upon a stool, do not sit upon a peck measure, do not lop off the shoots of a palm tree, do not poke a fire with a sword within the house, unquote. Wait, this is a quote? <laughs> That's a quote. Uh, so, so he learns hieroglyphics. Uh, he also learns the gift of putting things into enigmas right very strange ways of saying things he's learning ancient egyptian he now knows the mysteries furthermore there's a lot of confirmation here isn't there herodotus adds more influence that came from egypt saying that the pythagoreans agreed with the egyptians in not allowing the dead to be buried in wool as related to the, the, the sacred discourse so so we're, we're already getting some influence when it comes to practices and what's Pythagoras? Now, I mean, look at all the mysteries I revealed, and we just, okay, we'll just keep going. The Persians were a rising power at this time, conquering much of Asia, and the 526 even invaded and took over Egypt, overthrowing Othmos II. But now Pythagoras was also interested in the teachings of Zoroastrianism. Why not? And the Persians are here. Of course, this is the, obviously the principal belief system of the Persians. And so we are told by Laertes, yes, that Pythagoras, quote, also journeyed amongst the Chaldeans and the Magi, unquote. The Magi, of course, the high priests of Zoroastrianism. Uh, so, yeah, so now, now he's learning Zoroastrianism. He's just picking up all these ideas. Now, according to Laertes, Pythagoras, while in Crete, 
he went down into the cave of Ida with um, Epimenides. Epimenides. Now, now we have another legend. Right? So he's at Mount Ida in Crete with Epimenides. Epimenides is also semi-legendary, if not a semi-mythological uh, figure that stands at the liminal point between uh, fiction and history. He believed uh, to live in the 6th century BCE. Epimenides was a combination of a seer, a shaman, a philosopher, and a poet. The legend has it that while Epimenides was tending his father's sheep, he entered into a sacred cave of Zeus at the, ba at the base excuse me, of Mount Ida on Crete. And then he fell asleep and woke up 57 years later filled with magical powers, including the gift of prophecy, according to Diogenes Laertes. Many Greeks believe that Epimenides was not only involved in the Orphic mysteries, but one of the founders of them alongside Malpas and Omocritus. So, wow, another Orphic individual uh, connected to the life of Pythagoras, uh, to Mount Ida. Uh, Plutarch tells how Epimenides purified Athens after the ritual pollution brought on uh, uh, after, of course, uh, because they were negotiating with the Persians in the middle of the Persian War. Plutarch writes in his Life of Solon that the city was also visited with superstitious fears and strange appearances, and the seers declared that their sacrifices indicated pollutions and defilements which demanded explanation. Under these circumstances, they summoned to their aid from Crete, Epimenides, that's right, who is reckoned as the seventh wise man by some of those who refuse Perander a place on the list. He was reputed to be a man beloved of the gods and endowed with a mystical and heaven-sent wisdom in religious matters. Therefore, the men of his time said that he was the son of a nymph named Balte, and, and called him the new Curus. On coming to Athens, he made Solon his friend and assisted him in many ways and paved the way for his legislation. And then, of course, he purifies Athens. So this is pretty pretty cool stuff, right? So this is what another teacher of, of uh, Pythagoras, right? So what happens, of course, is many believe that uh, Epimenides died in Crete. But when he died, he was over 300 years old and then was honored as a god. Another version of the story, Epimenides was taken prisoner during the war between the Spartans and the Canossians. And because he refused a prophecy in favor of the Spartans, that was the reason why he was put to death. Pausanias writes that after Epimenides died, they found that his skin was covered in tattoos which is very unusual because the Greeks regulated tattoos to be only for slaves, meaning he must have been influenced by some shamanistic religion, perhaps from Central Asia. Of his works, Epimenides wrote prose works on purifications and sacrifices, oracles, a theogony, a work on the laws of Crete, a treatise on Minos, which of course will connect him to Minoan stories. Again, we're having another Minoan connection here an epic, epic uh, poem on the Argonauts, and the famous Critica, which uh, is quoted, of course, the Critica is quoted first, uh, sorry, two times uh, in the Bible, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, of course, when he's upon Mars Hill. Uh, Paul quotes him uh, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him. And it says, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are all offspring. And of course, this is a quote uh, from Epimenides. And so you have that quote. And the other one is found in Titus. Uh, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, had said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And of course, this is, uh, this is also, uh, so the Bible quotes this guy twice. And he's a teacher. And of course, Mount Ida, uh, uh, is is sacred uh, to uh, uh, 
to, well, of course, to the meter, right? So Mount Ida and the caves within it were, of course, sacred to Zeus, especially in connection to his birth by Rhea as she fled from her husband Kronos, having tricked him by switching Zeus with a swaddling stone. The Bibliotheca, a pseudo Philodorus, records Rhea, when she was heavy with Zeus, went off to Crete and gave birth to him there in a cave on Mount Dicte. She put him in the care of both the Curates and the Nymphae, Adrestia and Ida, daughters of the Melissae or Honeymen. And of course, I did this talk already. I just want to mention, just for those who haven't, these Nymphae nursed the baby with the milk, uh, Almathea, while the armed Curates stood guard over him in the cave banging their spears against their shields to prevent Cronus from hearing the infant's voice. Obviously, uh, Mount Ida, as I mentioned in the earlier talk, uh, is connected uh, to, uh, to Demeter uh, as well. Uh, so and I'll just do this really quick. Uh, so the idea is, is uh, you have the is, is the, is a word that connects to uh the idea of of, uh, of earth so ida means earth also from da you got ga which is gaia which is earth and then of course mater means mother so ida mater uh means um uh, earth mother right and so so mount ida is basically mount earth and connected to the goddess the mater and also uh, in many cases, the mater is connected with the goddess Rhea, and so the two conflate together. And why I'm bringing this up in this context is, well, guess who's getting all that? All this ancient Minoan religion from a guy who actually wrote on Minos and Rhododotus, right? Who actually focused some of his work on this earlier substratum and, of course, uh, connected to the Orphic Mysteries. Wow! <laughs> We're getting quite a bit here, right? So. Let's keep going down, <clears throat> going down this path. How are you doing so far, right? So what happens now? Okay, so, but when Pythagoras finally returned to Samos again, which is the third time, you wanted details, right? I'm giving you details, right? <clears throat> he was upset with what he found, the condition, and so he moved to Sicily instead. And then, of course, the, the southern part of, of Italy uh, when he was 40 years of age. So here we go. After that, he returned to Samos to find his country under the tyranny of Paul Crates. So he sailed away to Crotona in Italy. And there he laid down a constitution for the Italian Greeks. He and his followers were held in great estimation for being nearly 300 in number. So he had 300 followers. So well did they govern that state that his constitution was in effect a true aristocracy. I mean, so he takes over the place. Crotona, of course, is located towards the front part of the boot of Italy, just where it turns the form, the front. So let's just take a little, a few pictures here. Uh, let's let's go here, um, and we can we can see a few things, Margie. So, so there is Mount Ida. That's great. Thank you. So that's Mount Ida that we were just talking about. And to go to the next one. Oh, this is the Orphic Mysteries. We're going to be talking about this in a few seconds. Uh, so, um, okay. So uh, we'll just kind of go through these real quick. There's Orphic Mysteries. Are we talking about this? There's the head. Of Orpheus, there's the Orphic Mysteries you can see there, the Feast of Orpheus. That's good. We'll just keep going through these. Uh, that way we have them. Uh, these are the golden tablets that we'll be talking about in just a few moments. Uh, these are pathways to the underworld. There's some more of them. And, uh, and this, this is the so-called tomb of Pythagoras at Crotona. And the next one. Uh, and this is Crotona today. It's beautiful, isn't it? In Italy, kind of worth visiting. I've never been here. I'd love to go. And one more, I believe. I think there's one more. There it is. Thank you so much, Margie. All right. Thank you. That's great. So now you have an idea what's going to happen ahead. So uh, at Crotona, Pythagoras created a community 
of mystics with secret rites that were in many ways related to the Orphic mysteries. These, uh, so basically uh, those, uh, sorry, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, those active within the Orphic tradition were fond of theogonies. And so Hesiod's grand work in particular was very popular. What is also clear uh, is that they enjoyed embellishing these stories of the gods with even stranger elements filled with abstract speculations interwoven throughout with mystical nuances and connotations. And so what will happen uh, is all of these interesting stories that go all the way back to the Minoans and the Mycenaeans, the stories of that were told by Pherecydides and Epimenides. <clears throat> these stories will permeate the Orphic mysteries, and these this is part of the belief system, yes, of Pythagoras. So let's go there. So of all these tales, the myth of Dionysus Zagreus is the most important for deciphering Orphism. And so basically, this story is kind of it's kind of hard to listen to. But uh, here it is. It's a very strange one. So the story is Zeus uh, uh, goes unto uh, his mother, Rhea Demeter. So sometimes the mother is known as Rhea, and sometimes the mother, his mother is known as Demeter. So basically he's with his mom, and he sires Persephone. Then Zeus goes I'll just use like old King James English, goes unto Persephone in the form of a snake, right? In the form of a snake and sires Dionysus. Of course, we're back to that snake connection, right? To the child Dionysus, uh, he decides that uh, because it's mostly him, <laughs> right? It's mostly Zeus stuff because, you know, mom, daughter, uh, so what happens is that he says, I think Dionysus should be the king after me, should be the ruler after me. And so he wanted to place him on the throne and guard them uh, with the Corbantes. You know who's going to be upset about this whole setup? Of course, it's going to be Hera. Hello. So Hera sends, the, the, sends down or sends up the Titans who distract this child, little baby Dionysus, with these toys. And while the child is looking into a mirror, that's one of the ways they're, they're also enticing him, he is dragged from the throne, he's killed, and little Dionysus is torn to pieces. And then he's boiled, and then he's roasted, and then he's eaten. Okay, so not good. So Zeus is upset. You know, and uh, he looks, you know, that the Titans ate Dionysus, Dionysus, who is pure spirit, right? Who is spirit like me, has been gobbled up by these materialistic Titans. And so what he does is he sends down a lightning bolt. Boom. This is the Orphic Mysteries. <laughs> and what happens is the Titans are turned into ash. But who also is turned to ash is the remnants of baby Dionysus, who is spirit sprinkled amongst them. And so, according to the Orphic Mysteries, then what happens is that Zeus takes the ashes, partly material, this titanic material flesh, mingled amongst the pure. Dionysian spirit and makes humanity. And so humanity is a combination between a divine Dionysian spirit and an evil titanic flesh. In the Greek world, the repressive titanic nature of man was proverbial, expressing an innate evil nature that is exhibited by disobedience, according to Plato, of authorities and parents and laws. Uh, this evil soma, 
This evil body was considered a sema or tomb of the soul. The followers of Orpheus gave this name, the tomb, especially to the body because the soul is punished for that, uh, which is the, the, the outer covering, the flesh, the likeness, they say, of a prison. So our soul is in this prison in order that it must, must be kept in custody. So uh, until, of course, it has paid its special debt. Okay, so the correlation of Orphism, as you can see, to Christianity, <clears throat> with its duality between the spirit and flesh, the inward and divinely inspired goodness that's in a person in opposition to the inborn evil nature stemming from the wicked beings, whether Titans or Satan and his demons, and an afterlife with rewards and punishments. Uh, this is so obvious, I don't even need to go any further. Elaboration on this one. The Orphic belief uh, in the soul as a divine part and the body as impure part of man gave a deeper meaning to asceticism and various prohibitions, often dictating the conduct that was very much a part of the Pythagorean idea. So this is actually indeed the ideas of Pythagoras. Uh, and of course, obviously this gross story, which I think is gross, is merely symbolic. It's allegorical. It's meta metaphorical, but they have to tell you some way uh, that uh, we got this titanic nature uh, of the flesh and this, of course, this Dionysian spirit that we need to focus in on. And, of course, we are deep into Pythagorean right now. Concerning this dismemberment of Dionysus, Plutarch states as follows. I'm going to give you some more primary sources just to reaffirm, because remember, this is, this is, the, this is the belief system of Pythagoras. It would perhaps not be wrong to begin and quote lines of Empedocles as a preface. For here he says, uh, allegorically, those allegorically, that souls paying the penalty for murders and the eating of flesh and cannibalism are imprisoned in mortal bodies. However, it seems that this account is even older. For the legendary suffering of dismemberment told about Dionysus and the outrages of the Titans on him, and their punishments, and their uh, being blasted with lightning after having tasted of the blood. This is this is all a myth in its inner hidden meaning about reincarnation. What? <laughs> Wait, who's saying this? Plutarch! We have an aha uh, moment here. I'll say this again, this last part. And their punishments and their being blasted with lightning and having tasted of the blood. This is all a myth in its inner hidden meaning, he says, this ancient writer, about reincarnation. For that in us, which is irrational and disorderly and violent and not divine, but demonic, the ancients used the name Titan. And the myth is about being punished and paying the penalty. So shrouded in the story, because we know absolutely that Pythagoras believed in reincarnation. This idea of reincarnation is deeply invested in this myth that I told you. And where did you hear it from? Not me, but an ancient writer interpreting these ideas. And of course, going a little bit further. Plutarch argues in this work that to consume meat is unnatural to our true selves and part of our inferior titanic materiality that's tethered to us, arguing that we are not even equipped with the proper flesh-eating physical characteristics that are evident in meat-eating animals. Instead, argues Plutarch, we are to look to eat that which Dionysus produces for us. Dionysus the god, right? Inclusive of the fruit of the vine. For Plutarch to consume meat is to add to our own materiality, our weighted physical and wretched titanic, titanic aspect, and so guaranteeing our reincarnation, guaranteeing our reincarnation as our fleshly selves cannot be shaken if we add to it. And this idea, of course, we know for a fact uh, was part of the ideas of Pythagoras. And now I'm giving you the undergirdings of why. I know I'm revealing so many mysteries and it's all coming together, but we're not even done yet. 
Now, the golden tablets related to Orphism appear uh, to have started in southern Italy. <clears throat> you know, you know, southern Italy where, you know, <laughs> Pythagoras is. Spreading to Thessaly and then eventually went to Crete with the various instructions of magical formula becoming more abbreviated as they traveled around. These golden tablets were buried with the ashes of the deceased. According to the Hipponian and Polina gold tablets, Dionysus was indeed a central figure connected to the salvation of the soul. Both the Polina tablets in the second line declare, tell Persephone that Bacchios himself has released you, which is another Bacchus, which is, of course, connected to Dionysus. As the soul descends, many of the tablets instruct the soul to keep clear of the first spring they encounter. Most scholars agree that the first spring is lathe, the waters of forgetfulness, which one is to drink to forget their previous life so that they may be able to reincarnate again. To pass this first spring then means to bypass reincarnation and to seek eternal life without rebirth. Passing the first spring, the soul is to continue on to the Nemone Scene Spring, which is located on the right side of Hades, although one tablet uh, tells the soul to head for the spring on the left side of Hades. You know, people always get messed up in the directions. The variation should be attributed to the eclectic nature of these tablets in general, for they are a product of popular culture, and so variants would be expressed. Orphism was, a, was not an organized religion. Furthermore, these tablets also access other mystery traditions alongside the Dionysian mysteries of the Orphics. So lots of ideas. Uh, in the tablet uh, called the, uh, the Sakiki uh, tablet uh, from the second century BCE, a cypress tree accompanies this final spring. It says, I am parched with thirst and I perish. But give me to drink of the ever-flowing spring on the right with the cypress. Who are you? Where do you come from? And you say, I am the son of earth and starry heaven. With the question asked, the new uh, deceased knows the identity himself as part of being both heaven and earth. Perhaps the most detailed description of this journey to the underworld arise from the Eponian tablet. I'll read this, then we'll move on. This will give you, because again, we're wanting to know what happens in the afterlife. And of course, of Orphism, which of course, again, is his belief. So we are learning about his beliefs. We'll learn more about his particular aspects too, really soon. This grave belongs to memory for the time when he shall die. On the right side of the well-fitted house of Hades is a spring. And close to this stands a shining cypress. Around this place, the descending souls cool themselves. Do not approach this spring, but proceed to the lake of memory with cold water flowing forth. There are guardians here, and they will ask you with shrewd speech, what are you looking for in the darkness of deadly Hades? Say, I am a son of earth. And starry heaven, I am parched with thirst and perishing, but give me to drink from the cold water from memory's lake, and they will show you to the Chthonian king and give you to drink from memory's lake, and then having drunk, you will walk on the holy path of the many, on which also other renowned Mistai and Baki walk. Wow. Woo, okay. So, as emphasized here, the individual soul must at all costs remember their individual identity as both son of earth or daughter of earth and starry heaven. And so avoid the first spring. It's This is very vital. Forget the, uh, the spring of forgetfulness, right? Now, Pythagoras' disciples, as you can imagine, remember, this, these are viewpoints from that time revered him as a demigod. His words were believed inspired by the gods. In some cases, they even believed he was a literal god. And I'm going to quote, Indeed, his bearing 
is said to have been most dignified, and his disciples held the opinion about him that he was Apollo, come down to uh, from the far no north. Uh, there is a story that once when he was disrobed, his thigh was seen to be of gold. And when he crossed the river Nessus, quite a number of people said they heard it welcome him. So, I mean, hey, he has a golden thigh. That's pretty great, uh, supposedly, right? <laughs> uh, and, they, you know, rivers greet him. Well, in fact, quote, so greatly was he admired that his disciples used to be called, this is, I'm still quoting, prophets to declare the voice of God. They called them the prophets to declare the voice of God. So many people believe Pythagoras was a God. Besides which, I'm quoting still, he himself says in a written work that, quote, Quoting within a quote, I'm sorry. After 207 years in Hades, he has returned to the land of the living. Unquote within the quote. Thus it was, they remained his staunch adherents, and man came to hear his words from afar amongst the Lucanians, the Percalians, the Messapians, and the Romans. Unquote. Whoa. So he's Apollo. The Pyth Pythagoreans often declared, Quote, of rational beings, one sort is divine, one is human, and another such is Pythagoras. <laughs> Iamblichus said that. So, yeah, some people are divine. I mean, sorry, some of the rational beings are divine, uh, some are human, and there are Pythagoras. Who knows what he is, right? Follow along with these beliefs, many claim that Pythagoras appeared to radiate a light all about him, giving rise to to the idea that he was a demigod or a hero. Others, for instance, Aristotle, told how Pythagoras actually bit a snake to death. I don't know why you'd want to bite a poor snake. Uh, but then again, you had that whole snake mythos that we're kind of diving into a little bit. Aristotle also told how Pythagoras was able to be <laughs> in two places at one time. I want to be able to do that. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to do that? Two places at one time. For, this is Aristotle saying this. For example, one day he was seen both uh, in a place called Metapontum in Italy and at Croton in Sicily, uh, 200 miles away. It says Rivers even talked about him. Even after he supposedly died, many believed he did not, but as taught, continued on uh, as a god. This boon was granted to his followers, right? Um, but in some odd instances, this afterlife was tied to their actual tombs. For one story tells of a shepherd who was said, uh, said he heard the sound of chanting coming from the tomb of a Pythagorean teacher. So, so there's this offer of eternal life. Pythagoras is believed to have special powers. Yeah. Over nature and the animal world as well. And again, I'm just I'm quoting these works. He once approached the bear who had caused havoc in the region of Daunia, destroying property and uh, severely injuring a number of people. After approaching it and stroking it gently, feeding it from his hand on acorns, he compelled it by an oath to leave all living beings alone and be sent away. <laughs> the bear retreated to the mountains and the forest and was never again known to injure any, any person or animal. So he's able to talk to, to also in the town of Tarentum, he observed an ox in a pasture feeding on green beans. He advised the herdsman to tell his ox that it would be better if he ate other kinds of food. The herdsman laughed, remarking he did not know the language of an oxen. But if Pythagoras did, uh, he was more than welcome to tell him himself. Pythagoras approached the ox and whispered into his ear for a long time. The ox never again ate beans and lived to a very old age near the temple of Hera in Teratim, where he was treated as sacred. 
Then, uh, when Pythagoras traveled to Olympia for the athletic games, he met with a group of friends and fell into a discussion concerning prophecies, omens, and divine signs. He took the position that men of piety continually received messages from the gods if they but attuned themselves to their calling. He believed that we can talk to the gods. We can do so. We still, you know, a lot of people, well, that's the old days. That's the old times. It doesn't happen now. No, he believes it still happens. Then suddenly, flying over his head at that moment was an eagle. This eagle, who at his signal turned, descended, and perched on Pythagoras's arm. After stroking her a while and continuing his conversation, he released her. Through this and other similar occurrences, Pythagoras demonstrated that he and those who adopted his teaching might possess the same dominion over savage animals as Orpheus, who lured and captivated animals by the power of his song. Even beyond the animal world, Pythagoras was believed to have special powers over nature in general, and so could accordingly, accurately predict earthquakes. He was able, uh, through his influence with divine and natural forces, to end an epidemic, to suppress violent storms, I'm quoting here, to calm rough waters on rivers and seas for safe passage of his friends, Epidocles and Epimenides, both of whom learned these arts from Pythagoras, performed similar deeds. Empedocles indeed was called Alexamus, a verter of the winds, because of his abilities. So he's teaching others these supposed abilities. And you know, one is one is one has to think about the the, the calming of the seas and the story of Jesus, right? On the, on the Sea of Galilee, uh, calming the seas. So Pythagoras has all already been claimed to do so. Pythagoras was believed to possess special powers of discernment. Once. During a trip from Cyberus to Croton, Pythagoras happened to meet a group of fishermen. And they drew up onto the shore, their nets filled with fish. As an amusement, he told them he knew the exact number of fish they had caught. The fishermen declared that if he was correct, they would do anything he said. After the fish had been counted, it was found that he had predicted accurately. His request was simply that they return the fish alive to the sea. What is most extraordinary, uh, says the source, that while they stood on the shore, not one fish died. Although they remained out of the water for some time, Pythagoras then paid the fishermen the price of their fish and continued on to, to Croton. So they didn't, they didn't lose any money on this one. He, he, you know, he gave a demonstration, but he did pay for the fish that were returned. Then there is a story, and I do have to tell you the story, uh, of Pythagoras uh, and Abaris the Hy um, Hyperborean. Abaris the Hyperborean. Abaris, at that time, of his first encounter with Pythagoras, was already an elderly man, a priest amongst the Hyperboreans, uh, to the Greeks, the Hyperboreans were a people of mysterious origin and significance, occupying a mountainous land far to the north. This was the region of Apollo's birth, uh, to which the god returned each winter. The Hyperboreans were the architects, for example, of the first temple of Apollo at Delphi. So they go way back, and many they connect them to the ancestors of the Celts, um, which is interesting. Uh, so what happens is uh, as follows. So so. What happens is that he's uh, Abarius is traveling to the islands uh, from the Hyperboleans. He's he's going down, um, uh, and um, he's also a vegetarian, and he is a worshiper of Apollo and Artemis. Now, during this journey, he lived amongst the priests he visited. He foretold the future events to his hosts by reading the entrails of animals, and reportedly was never seen to eat or drink. And so he's traveling around, and he arrives, he arrives, of course, uh, to meet Pythagoras. 
And, uh, oh, by the way, one little fun bit. Apparently, a Baris has something called a magic dart. A magic dart. Um, um, it's hard to express, but this, this dart was pretty amazing. It uh, uh, had powers of transporting him to different locations. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, which is which is pretty pretty amazing, uh, you know. So if he has any obstacles, uh, this magic dart uh, helped him. Again, uh, very uh, strange stories. So Pythagoras accepted. Uh, so when he meets Pythagoras, he actually gives Pythagoras this dart of Apollo, without expressing any surprise or amazement of the powers that Abaris ascribed to it, and then. What happens is, is Abaris declares as follows. Okay. Then he took Abaris aside and showed him that he possessed a golden thigh, proof that he was not mistaken in recognizing his true identity as Apollo. As further proof of his divinity, Pythagoras described to him details of his Hyborian temple, then explained that he had come from uh, into the regions of mortality, to ease the suffering of living creatures, assuming a human form, lest men and women overcome by the vision of his transcendence should conclude that the disciplines he advised were beyond human power. So here we have a story where supposedly, of course, uh, Abaris is, this guy is really Apollo in human form. And supposedly, Pythagoras uh, says that he was brought into the world uh, uh, to, uh, to to uh, to the regions of mortality to ease the suffering of living creatures, assuming a human form, lest men and women, overcome by visions of his transcendence, should conclude that the disciplines he advised were beyond human power. He's coming. Now, I want I, I want to stay. I don't. We're going to go over absolutely. But we have to focus here. This is a, this in a sense is the idea of Pythagoras being declared as a god who is sent by the gods to alleviate suffering, to recognize the fact, right, that, uh, that, that we have a titanic nature. And a Dionysian spirit, but we got to focus on a Dionysian spirit. And then, of course, through the Orphic Mysteries, we can be saved. <laughs> I mean, this is just bizarre, right? Yeah, and I know many of you are thinking Christianity, Christianity, Christianity. I know. But this is, <laughs> this is the 500s. So, uh, no, uh, but this is pretty early. Okay. So what happens is Abaris now joins, he's so old, he doesn't want to go back to the Hyperboreans. So Abaris, Abaris joins the community of Pythagoreans at Croton because he's already of advanced age and unskilled and uninitiated in Greek learning. Pythagoras did not compel Abaris to master all the introductory theorems or to undertake a period of silence, nor hear his preparatory lectures already we are having an insight into how one becomes part of this community right here. But considered him fit as an immediate listener to his most profound doctrines. Abaris studied uh, physiology and theology and abandoned the practice of divining by entrails of beasts. In this place, he perfected the art of prognostication by numbers. Recognizing this to be a method pure and more divine, partaking directly of the celestial numbers of the gods. And so now we're going into math, mathematical equations as a means. Now, claims of his divine attributes appear to increase in late antiquity to the point where periphery, the Neoplatonist, emphasizes Pythagoras' divine aspects uh, as almost appearing as just like. Jesus is this comparison. Now, we're going to go a little bit further. I told you I'm going to deliver, and I am going to deliver. Here's more. More 
Okay, more mysteries. So those who are part of his mystic community at Crotona were to ascribe to the belief that they were absolutely equal and were to share all things in common. According to the Timaeus, he was the first to say, friends have all things in common, as well as friendship is equality. I, you know, it's very simple, but I really like that. Friendship is, e is equality. Shouldn't friendship always be equality? I think that many of us have situations where we're in friendships and we don't feel like we're equal to these friendships, that we treat them as above ourselves, or sometimes we treat them like others are below ourselves. If it's a true friendship, it is always equal. If it's not equal, according to Pythagoras, it doesn't add up, and it's not a friendship. I love that, and I believe that firmly. Good stuff, right? That, that's a takeaway for this, this. That's a takeaway for this talk, right? Okay, um, indeed, his disciples did put all their possessions into one common stock. Did you know they, just like the early church, yeah, they, they shared all their possessions together within their community of, of around 300 people. They shared all things in common. Uh, so it's very equal. For Pythagoras, friendship constituted all the loyalty that went with it, even uh, loyalty unto death as illustrated by Exotonius' story of Damon, who was willing to stand surety for his friend, Benetius, who has also been sentenced to death. So side by side, if somebody is sentenced to death, well, me too, I'm going to be with my friend. Whoa. If, if um, someone's true friend, Pythagoras believed they would not break bread together. Now, this is interesting. If you're a true friend, you will not break bread together you will share the same loaf. <laughs> Hence, representing their unity. So, uh, so uh, I'll quote here. Not to break bread, for once friends used to meet over one loaf, as the barbarians do even to this day, and you should not divide bread, which brings them together. His community consisted of both men and women who were both believed worthy of full philosophical training. Pythagoras introduced the revolutionary idea that male, this time is revolutionary, of course, obviously, I'm obviously, that male and female were absolutely equal in every way, and so were to treat one another as equals. This is unheard of in ancient times, at least in the Greco-Roman world. When it came to classes, while Pythagoras recognized slavery as an institution, he insisted that slaves were to be treated in the most humane way as possible and with respect and could also be part of the community. In his mind, all were permitted to join the community without reservation and become part of his family. As for initiation uh, into Pythagoras's family, it was a rather long process. For five whole years, they had to keep silence, merely uh, listening to his discourses without actually seeing him either. You don't, you're not allowed to see him until they pass an examination. And thence afterwards, they were admitted to his house and allowed to see him. I'm actually quoting this from ancient times. Decorum was important to Pythagoras uh, and his followers, including the value of silence which was emphasized in the initiation process. As late as the fourth century, Isocrates relates how people marvel more at the silence of those who profess to be his pupils than at those who have the greatest reputation for speaking. The ability to remain silent was seen as important training in self-control. In the latter tradition, a report that those who wanted to become Pythagoreans had to observe a five-year silence. I am looking says this here too. Some of the Pythagoreans created rules for some of the most mundane aspects of life. For example, setting up the practice that one must put the right shoe on first or one must not travel the public roads. <laughs> when it comes to deities, 
the ones that were revered the most were Zeus, no surprise, Demeter, no surprise, you know, and of course Dionysus, no surprise, right? They were revered in his community and their worship of them permeated their lives. So they're always worshiping Zeus, Demeter, and Dionysus and <laughs> permeated their lives and even, even the afterlife. Laertus notes, they would never use coffins at, of Cyprus because the scepter of Zeus was made from it. So we are informed by Hermippus in the second book on Pythagoras. Uh, so quoting, as for the house of Pythagoras, the Metapontus named his house the Temple Demeter and his porch the museum. So, uh, so yeah, he named his he named his house the Temple Demeter. When Pythagoras arrived in Italy, he brought his mother with him. I know you're going to hear stories you've never heard before. He brought mom with him, who was apparently, obviously, still alive at that time, and and it is. And it is in connection to his mother that we learn of another curious act of Pythagoras when he first settled down at Crotona. For Diogenes Laertes records, Hemippus gives another anecdote. Pythagoras, on coming to Italy, made a subterranean dwelling, an underground dwelling. Hey, that sounds like a slave. Remember, a slave made this underground dwelling? Well, it looks, he made a subterranean dwelling and enjoyed on his mother to mark and record all that passed in one hour and to send her notes down to him until he should ascend. She did so. So he goes into this underground place and he stays there. I'm still reading the primary source. Pythagoras sometime afterwards came up withered and looking like a skeleton, then went into the assembly and declared he had been down to Hades and even read out his experiences to them. They were so affected that they wept and they wailed and looked upon him as divine, going so far as to send their wives to him in hopes that they would learn some of his doctrines. And so they were called Pythagorean women, unquote, from ancient times. Whoa. So what is, so here Pythagoras, <clears throat> in a sense, creates his own personal mysteries of descent and ascent, which again, probably reminds me of his, of his slave earlier, right? Self-initiated himself first and foremost into the mysteries he was then going to introduce to his followers at Crotona. His descent into Hades represented his death. And of course, his emergence represented his rebirth as something different and having a deeper knowledge. Often there is confusion over what he dictated and was written down and what he wrote and what his disciples wrote. And so there's this problem, this controversy. Diogenes Laertes says, there are some who insist absurdly enough that Pythagoras left no writings whatsoever. This is Diogenes Laertes writing this from ancient times. At all events, Heraclitus, the physicist, almost shouts in our ear, Pythagoras, some of Menarchus, practiced inquiry beyond all other men, and in this selection of his writings made himself a wisdom of his own, showing much learning, but poor workmanship. Uh, the occasion of this remark, I'm still reading the source, was the opening words of Pythagoras' treatise on nature, on nature, namely, nay, I swear by the air I breathe, I swear by the water I drink, I will never suffer censor on account of this work. That's a quote from Pythagoras himself. Pythagoras, in fact, wrote three books. The first one was on education. This is from ancient times. The second was on statesmanship. And the third was on nature. Many scholars today still maintain that Pythagoras himself did not write anything. Uh, but he's like Jesus later on, relied on the students to do so. Most notably his wife and daughters. That's a possibility. It is possible. But it's also, but also the ancients are disagreeing. 
the story goes back and forth. That's why we're getting the position from ancient times. Many of the teachings of Pythagoras were supposed to be secret, as noted by Diogenes Laertes, and the rest of the Pythagoreans used to say that not all his doctrines were for all men to hear. Our authority for this being uh, Antiochus in his 10th book of his rules. Uh, so, um, meanwhile, uh, Dicaris is upset by the fact that Pythagoras students were so tight-lipped about his teachings that it was difficult to figure out what he taught. <clears throat> Aristotle adds how Pythagoras Pythagoreans guarded amongst their very secret doctrines that one type of rational being is divine, one human, and one such as Pythagoras, right? Furthermore, not many people actually heard Pythagoras speak. In fact, according to ancient times, this is a quote, not less than 600 persons went to his evening lectures, and those who were privileged to see him wrote to their friends congratulating themselves on a great piece of good fortune. Wow, unquote. It was during the time of Plato in the latter part of the fourth century that much of his doctrines were fully revealed. Okay. Down to the time of uh, Philo Lewis, it was not possible to acquire knowledge of any Pythagorean doctrine. And Philo Lewis alone brought out those three celebrated books, which I just quoted uh, as being, which Plato sent a hundred minas to purchase. So Plato, he wants these mysteries of Pythagoras. And so he paid, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, paid uh, for this purchase. He, 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 he bought these books. So obviously he's a follower of Pythagoras, Plato, aha moments, waking up. This is a big deal. Of course it is. Pythagoras has a lot of influence. Pythagoras was most famous in Greek and Roman era for his beliefs concerning the transmigration of souls, also known as reincarnation. In fact, uh, Pythagoras uh, was often directly connected as the first Greek philosopher to fully articulate this idea, which was often alluded to from before but not put together in a systematic way. Periphery uh, declares that of all his doctrines, of Plato's doctrines, this is Periphery, the famous Neoplatonist, the most recognized was, quote, that the soul is immortal and that it transmigrates into other kinds of animals, unquote. But as we learn from his earlier teacher, uh, Pherasonides, remember him? Um, uh, as we learned, it uh, it is not that others did not allude to such beliefs before or after his time. Yet, according to Eon of Chaos um, from the 5th century BCE, Pythagoras was the master over his teacher, stating that Pherasonides uh, was, although dead, he has a pleasant life for his soul. If Pythagoras is truly wise, who knew and learned wisdom beyond all men? So this is alluding to the fact that uh, Pythagoras is smarter than his own teacher. While Herodotus records how the Thracian, Zalmechus, remember the, the slave, taught his countrymen that they would never die, but instead go to a place where they would eternally possess all good things. Um it appears he appears to believe that Zalmechus was before the time of Pythagoras. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. So you have this kind of strange connection. Uh, many Greeks believed that Pythagoras was gifted with recollecting his past lives and that he was once um, Athelides, uh, who is the son of the god Hermes. Again, Dionysus Laertes records this belief as follows. This is what Heraclitus of Pontus tells us. He used to say about himself that he had once been a Chaldees and was accounted to be Hermes' son. And Hermes told him he might choose any gift he liked except immortality. So he asked to retain through life and through death a memory 
of his experiences. Hence, I'm still quoting from ancient times, hence in life, he could recall everything. And when he died, he still kept the same memories. Now, before we go any further, oh yeah, remember the Orphic Mysteries? Oh yeah, remember don't drink from the, the, the river, sorry, the, the spring of lay, the forgetfulness, drink from the, the, the lake of memory. Not that he's achieve, achieving liberation necessarily, but it looks like there's this idea that uh, those in the Orphic Mysteries are able to remember their past lives. This is an example. I'm going to keep quoting. Don't worry. Afterwards, in course of time, his soul entered into Euphorbus, and Menelaus wounded him. Now, Euphorbus used to say that he had once been a Pelotes and obtained this gift from Hermes. And then he told of his wanderings of his soul and how it migrated hither and thither and how many plants and animals it had come and all that uh, it underwent in Hades and all that the other souls had to endure. That's a lot to unpack. So basically what's happening is perhaps in between these lifetimes or before your lives go through plants as well as animals, your soul. <laughs> when Euphorbus died, I'm still quoting, his soul passed into uh, Hermotimius, and he also wishing to authenticate the story, went up to the temple of Apollo uh, and Brandach, where he identified the shield which Menelaus on his voyage home from Troy had, had dedicated to Apollo. So he said, the shield being now so rotten through and through that the ivory facing was only left. And when, so now, so basically all these figures are saying, hey, I remember a past life. I'm going to give you a proof. And they're giving proofs. <clears throat> when <clears throat> Hermitimus died, he became Phyrus, a fisherman from Delos. Okay, I guess, okay, he became a common fisherman, all right? And again, he remembered everything, how he was first, Athelides, then Euphorbus, then uh, Hermotimus, and then Phyrus. When Phyrus died, he became Pythagoras and still remembered all the facts mentioned. I got to tell you, I'm not done, but I got to tell you, this is a big text. Yes, the ancients believe in reincarnation. Here I'm giving a real big example of that. And yes, Pythagoras believes in it, and it becomes a major doctrine, but also goes into how it works. That it's not just humans, but it's also animals and plants that the soul goes through. Pythagoras emphasized that each of us possessed a unique soul that could proceed through these multiple rebirths and finally liberation. Pyth Pythagoras perceived the makeup of the soul as follows. What? I know. I'm going to give you even more. I'm going to tell you now his viewpoint of the soul. This is what you're looking for, isn't it? Okay. The soul of man, he says, is divided into three parts. Intelligence, reason, and passion. Other animals possess intelligence and passion as well, but reason by man alone. The seed of the soul extends from the heart to the brain. The part of it which is in the heart is passion, while the parts located in the brain are reason and intelligence. The senses are distillations from these. Reason is immortal. All else is mortal. Again, Reason is immortal. All else is mortal. The soul draws nourishment from the blood. The faculties of the soul are winds, for they are as well as uh, the soul are invisible, just as ether is invisible. The veins and arteries and sinews are the bonds of the soul. But when, but when it is strong and settled down into itself, Reasoning and deeds become its bonds. When cast out upon the earth, it wanders in the air like the body. 
Hermes is the steward of the souls, and for that reason is called Hermes, the escorter, Hermes, the keeper of the gate, Hermes of the underworld, since it is he who brings in the souls from their bodies, both by land and sea, and the pure are taken into the uppermost region, but the impure are not permitted to approach the pure or each other, but are bound by the furies in bonds unbreakable. The whole air is full of souls, he says. Whoa. The whole air is full. So he's talking about the process of these souls and Hermes escorting these souls uh, into various forms of life here on earth. But he says even the whole air is full of souls, which are called the jinn or genie or heroes. These are they who send men dreams and signs of future disease and health. And not to men alone, but the sheep also and cattle as well. And it is to them that purifications and lustrations, all divination and omens and the like have reference. The most momentous thing in human life is the art of winning the soul to good or evil. Blessed are the men who acquire a good soul. And if it be bad, they can never be at rest, nor ever keep the same course two days together. Whoa, okay. Oh, it's so much here. We got to keep going, but you now understand how he understands us. So I like the whole, the whole air. Everything is full of spirits and souls. Everything is alive. Uh, so, so it's very animistic in many ways. The soul is everywhere, but still guided from place to place. And it is more than just humans. It's animals and plants and so forth. Whoa. Now, we must recollect uh, the fact that this idea of reincarnation was shocking for many Greeks uh, who believe that after death one dwelt upon a shadowy plane, fading away into oblivion unless those who know them, specifically you know, relatives, made offerings to feed their soul. This afterlife was so terrible. One depiction tells how we will be reduced to entities squeaking like bats while Achilles, Achilles Famous, he said that he would rather be the lowest mortal on earth than the king of the underworld. That's a, it's in obviously the, the Odyssey. Furthermore, according to uh, Dioscorus, in addition to the immortality of the soul and reincarnation, Pythagoras believed that after certain periods of time, the things that have happened once happen again and nothing is absolutely new that's a quote from periphery uh from dioscorus i'll read it again this is another huge idea in addition to the immortality of soul pythagoras is believed to have i'm quoting after certain periods of time the things that have happened once happen again and nothing is absolutely moved this is the idea of a doctrine known as eternal recurrence uh and aristotle uh, pupil uh eudemus also talks about it so so basically the doctrine of transmigration thus seems to have been extended to include the idea that we and indeed the whole world will will be reborn into lives that are exactly the same as those we are living and having already lived oh, you're boom the brains are going let's keep going pythagoras apparently taught that humanity was on a wheel of birth which is an exact connection to samsara this is i mean which is the wheel of suffering in hinduism and of course buddhism for he taught that what one does in this life whether good actions or bad actions, which of course you know will be understood as karma in Hinduism, will directly determine where the soul will go in the next life. Pythagoras asserted, quote, from ancient times, the soul bound now in this creature, now in that, thus goes on a round ordained of necessity. Unquote. If one wanted to move on to a better life uh, the next time and eventually be liberated altogether, 
certain ethical standards need to be observed. To be free of this mortal coil, Pythagoras taught that one, first and foremost, had to be followers of the truth, not falsehood. Pythagoras said that, that he, dedic he was dedicated to telling the truth without compromise as much as possible. One story told about his experience in Hades. Yeah, he's telling a story about him in Hades. In between one of his multiple lives uh, that served as a warning to him that his pursuit to truth must never waver. The story goes, <clears throat> the same authority as we have seen asserts that Pythagoras took his doctrines from the Delphic priestess Thermostelia. Hieronymus, however, says that when he had descended into Hades, he saw the soul of Hesiod bound fast to a brazen pillar and gibbering, and the soul of Homer hung on a tree with serpents writhing about it, this being their punishment for what they had said about the gods. He also saw under torture those who would remain faithful, uh, th th those who would not be remain faithful to their wives. This, says our authority, is why the people of Croton honored them. Uh, and so, of course, on the so uh, Aristippus of Cyrene affirms his work on the physicist that he was named Pythagoras because he uttered the truth as infallibly as the Pythian oracle. So, so, so basically, telling the truth is one of the biggest way out of the material realm and to be free, to be free of the shackles uh, of this domain. That's, so I'm telling you now more of how. Pythagoras tells us to get out of the situation, to be liberated. Okay. Now, for his followers, Pythagoras established certain purification rites to achieve this goal of eventual liberation. These rites included rules for ethical conduct, dietary observations, and ascetic disciplines, paralleling that prescribed by, of course, Indian guru. As noted by Diogenes Laertes concerning Pythagoras, purifications is by cleansing. Baptism, baptism, hmm. and lustration, and by keeping clean from all deaths and births and all pollution, and abstaining from meat and flesh of animals that have died, mullets, gurnards, eggs, and egg sprung animals, beans, and other absences prescribed by those who perform mystic rites in the temple. He emphasized the idea of the moderation of all things. So no overeating, no over drinking. And, you know, and uh, he says, drinking, he calls in a word, a snare and discontinence all excess, saying that no one should go beyond due proportion, either in drinking or eating or even sexual indulgence too. He says, keep to the winter for sexual pleasures. In the summer, abstain. <laughs> they are less harmful in autumn and spring, but they are always harmful and not conducive uh, to health. Ask once when a man should consort with a woman. He replied, when you want to lose the strength that you have. <laughs> anyway, yet the highest goal was to achieve special knowledge uh, that will be enable one's soul to transcend this life, which entailed a love of wisdom. Hence, many Greeks believed that Pythagoras was the one who coined the phrase philosophy, which does, of course, mean the love of wisdom. But no special knowledge would arrive without properly addressing the source of that knowledge, that being, that being the gods themselves, and so they must be given their full due recognition and worship properly. And so as an essential part of his ethical philosophy, Pythagoras emphasized the importance of proper and well thought out religious ritual and reverence to the gods. Uh, so, so he's not to let victims be brought for sacrifice to the gods and to worship only at the altar unstained with blood, not to call the gods to witness man's duty being rather to strive to make his own words carry conviction, to honor their elders, 
on the principle that the precedence in time gives a greater title respect. Basically, it goes on, talks about friends and other people. He says, basically, you got, you know, in order to honor God, you know what you got to do? You got to honor your fellow person. You got to honor your friends. You got to honor, he mentioned specifically, the elderly. Then you are in right accord to the gods. Does that make sense? You know, it's like, don't go to the gods and, you know, try to do all these rituals. They're empty because the gods want you to get along with everybody, to make peace with everybody, with your brother, with your sister, with your mother, with your father, with your friends, with your grandma, grandpa, everybody. I love how he mentions the elderly here. This is interesting. You guys learning things. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you're a hypocrite. Now, he says, as a basic belief, Diogenes Laertes said to Pythagoras that he, for, quote, forbids us to pray for ourselves because we do not know what will help us. He, he believes it is for others to pray for us, and together we are helped. But the gods themselves know what's best for us. So we're supposed to pray for others, and others are supposed to pray for us. Um we do have some of the rituals here. He is kind of picky on something. Some of the rituals to be followed were quite particular. Uh, for example, Pythagoras, to pour libations to the gods, you got to make sure that you, you hold it from the handle of the cup. So you don't hold the whole cup. You make sure that you hold it from the handle as you pour the offerings. As for animals, I know you're waiting for this. As for animals, uh, they were to be both Loved and respected, according to uh, Diochorus, one of Pythagoras's more popular doctrines was that, quote, all animate beings are of the same family, unquote, which includes animals. Because of this belief, Pythagoras advocated a vegetarian diet and wished one to refrain from eating meat. For as mentioned by Di Diogenes Laertes, it was Pythagoras, quote, who forbade even the killing, let alone the eating of animals, which share with us the privilege of having a soul. This was the excuse put forward. But his real reason for forbidding animal diet was to, pra was to practice people and accustom them to simplicity of life so that they could live on things easily procurable spreading their tables with uncooked foods and drinkable pure water only for this way was the way to have a healthy body and a keen mind of course the only altar so quoting at which uh, he worshiped was that of apollo the giver of life uh, behind the altar of horns at delos for therein were placed flour and meal cakes without the use of fire and there was no animal victim as was told by Aristotle. So the idea is, is that it's not just refraining from eating meat. Meat is expensive too, and it involves suffering. And for him, it should be just easy for us to eat and not focus upon those things that a simple diet is a healthier diet. It just makes us more healthy. That, that was his idea. That was true or not. That's his idea. Uh, Eudokius, the 4th century Pythagorean mathematician, a philosopher, says that he not only abstained from animal food, but also uh, could not even come near butchers or hunters. And so, however, Aristotle said that uh, this is not true, that the Pythagorean dietary observances, he said that Pythagorean refrained from eating the womb and the heart, the sea and enemy, and some other things but use other animal food. So, so apparently, because, in fact, there's other contradictions that say, though, maybe Pythagoras had fish. Others say that he didn't have fish. Some people said that on occasion, he would do an animal sacrifice. Others would say he doesn't do it at all. However, no matter what, the answer is still having very little meat, a little fish, and that's about it. And beans were off limits beans were evil what beans were off limits and his followers couldn't have beans according to aristotle in his work on the pythagoreans yes he wrote a work aristotle wrote a work on pythagoreans pythagoras counseled abstinence from beans 
either because I'm actually reading here that they are like the genitals or because they are like the gates of Hades as being alone unjoined, unjointed, or because they're injurious or because they are like the form of the universe or because they belong to oligarchy or because they are like the form of the universe or because they belong to oligarchy since they are used in election by lot. <laughs> okay. So it's so we learn later on, which we won't have time to talk about, that beings are connected to perhaps deeper mysteries. Furthermore, another of his precepts, uh, also, I'll just tell you this. Uh, the idea is that the beings were believed to have captured within them in them the spirit of air. And air is connected to spirit. And so the idea is some of the mysteries, some of the beliefs are always ascribed to it, that these beings, the reason why they have these airs, which people <clears throat> have to eat a lot of beans and what comes out of you. That's right. <clears throat> yes, that uh, is, is because they're trapped this air, which is life which has to do with the souls. And so in many cases, beings could be connected to souls before they're reincarnated. So they kind of go into the beans. <laughs> Watch out. Okay, so there you go. All right, moving on. Uh, as to his own personal diet, some say he, he contented himself with just some honey or a honeycomb or bread, never touching wine in daytime and with greens or boiled or raw for dainties and fish but rarely so again yeah fish as a diet but fish wasn't considered meat in the ancient world as a whole for many in the ancient world in dress pythagoras uh, robes were white and spotless his quilts of white wool uh, read an ancient source uh, for linen had not yet reached those parts he was never known to overeat to behave loose loosely or to be drunk he would avoid laughter and all pandering to tastes such as insulting jests and vulgar tales. He would punish neither slaves uh, nor free man of anger, abdomen, uh, he used for calling things setting rights. Now, uh, now uh, what happens is, what about, uh, uh, now one would expect that with all his strict ascetic behavior and rigid personal discipline, that he would be single. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, he was married. Uh, and even had daughters and sons, which we'll talk about soon. Uh, so, in fact, um, I'll just tell you this here. Um, uh, here it is. Um, her name is Thano, who also wrote a few things. Furthermore, a story is told that being asked how many days it was before a woman becomes pure after intercourse, she replied, with her own husband all at once with another man never <laughs> so so uh he and his wife were very much into marital faithfulness uh theano he of course he had a daughter and his daughter was involved in keeping uh his, his mysteries and of course a son and so forth uh so there you have it um i know uh we got a lot of things here obviously um we don't have a lot of time for it but I will just mention that uh, uh, one of, the, of course, one of the biggest areas connected to Pythagoras is related to his mathematics uh, and cosmology. While Plato, Aristotle uh, do not mention Pythagoras' works in this area, we must remember that they were not interested in investigating that topic in relation to philosophy. But uh, others were, and so, so we do have Pythagoras proposed that musical notes could be converted into numerical ratios. Eventually, he came to believe that all things could be understood as numerical, as mathematics. The origins of the universe were numerical in essence too, as noted by Diogenes Laertes, quoting Alexander in his Succession of Philosophers, where he says, quote, he found in the Pythagorean uh, memoirs the following tenets as well. The principle of all things is the monad or the unit. Arising from this monad, the undefined dyad or two serves as material substratum of the monad, which is the cause, 
from the monad and the undefined dyad spring numbers, from numbers points, from points lines, from lines plane figures, from plane figures solid figures, from solid figures sensible bodies, the elements of which are, are four, fire, water, earth, and air. These elements interchange and in turn into another completely and combine to produce a universe animate. I'm still quoting from ancient times. Animate, intelligent, spherical, with the earth at its center, the earth itself too being spherical and inhabited roundabout. Unquote. <laughs> so here the numbers descend into objects and to the very round earth. At one point, he declared that the most beautiful figure in the sphere amongst the solids uh, and is the circle amongst the plane figures. So you have these ideas, right? Accordingly, Pythagoras saw the cosmos as structured according to numbers. Uh, in, in the fours, as a source of all wisdom, his cosmos was also imbued with a moral significance. Uh, so there is a morality that is entwined within uh, the universe itself. Pythagoras went further, believing that all relationships, all connections, even those considered abstract, like love, beauty, truth, and justice, could be assigned a numerical component. He also taught the concept of the harmony of the stars. Here, uh, planets and stars move following exact mathematical equations, which then exactly correspond to musical notes, and so create a symphony. Of course, uh, uh, we get these ideas from late antiquity. He also talks about the idea that uh, uh, there are also antipodes, of our hours down and up, light and darkness have equal parts in the universe. So have hot and cold, dry and, and moist. I know we're getting a New York accent there, sorry. And of these, if hot preponderance, we have summer, if cold, winter. He believes in this duality of opposites that work together. Uh, that's quite a bit here, uh, but we don't have time. So how did Pythagoras die? <laughs> Oops, I mean, okay, so I feel like an athlete for, for scholasticism. Okay. All right. So how did Pythagoras die? For this information, it really depends on who you ask. <laughs> Diogenes Laertes says, Pythagoras met his death in this wise. As he sat one day amongst his acquaintances, at the house of Milo, it chanced that the house was set ablaze uh, out of jealousy by one of the people who were not accustomed, worthy of admittance to his presence. Though some say it was the work of the inhabitants of Croton, anxious to safeguard themselves against the setting up of a tyranny. Uh, so they're basically burning down uh, the house of Milo. Uh, one, maybe because somebody's angry because you know, I, I'm not a good, I was not a, a a proper initiate. You know, I didn't make it in. Well, yeah, it's probably because you couldn't stay quiet for five years. <laughs> so that's maybe it. Uh, anyway, or it could be the fact that, remember, he kind of created this little, uh, this little commune government. Well, there are some of the people in the nearby town are afraid that's going to turn into a tyranny. Anyway, so Pythagoras was caught as tried to escape. He got as far as a certain field of beans, where he stopped, saying he would be captured rather than cross it. I told you, he's against beans. He's against beans so much that he won't even cross a field of beans. He said, he'll capture rather than cross it and be killed rather than prate about his doctrines. And so his pursuers cut his throat. So also were murdered more than half of his disciples to the number of 40 and thereabouts. It looks like they have been reduced to number from 300. That's half 40 down to 80. Right. But a very few, uh, but a very few escaped, including Archippus of Tarentum and Lysias already mentioned. Wow. So 
But there's one poet proclaimed, whoa, whoa, whence Pythagoras, this deep reverence for beans. <laughs> Why did he fall in the midst of his disciples? A bean field there was his durst not cross. Sooner than trap on it, he endured to be slain at the crossroads by the man of Akadas. Well, so you can see beans uh, are prohibited. Are they sacred? Are they reincarnated souls? <laughs> you know, what is it? <laughs> but uh, you don't, don't, don't mess with the beans. Uh, can you believe he died because he wouldn't cross a field of beans? But of course, there's still another version. Also recorded by Diogenes Laertes. Diochorus, however, says that Pythagoras died a fugitive in the temple of the Muses at uh, Metapontum after 40 days of starvation. Heraclides, in his epitome on the lives of Satyrus, says that after burying uh, uh, Pericles of Delos, uh, he returned to Italy. And when he found uh, Cylon of Croto giving a luxurious banquet to all and sundry, he retired to Metapontum to end his days there by starvation, having no wish to live any longer. On the other hand, Hermippus relates that when the men of Argumentum and Syracuse were at war, Pythagoras and his disciples went out and fought uh, with the army. Uh, and they were killed by the Syracusians. There's lots of stories of how he died. Self-starvation, not crossing the field of beans, or died in, in battle. Whatever the case, Pythagoras was already very old by that time. According to Heraclides, he was 80 years old when he died, and this agrees with his own description of his life of man. Uh, uh, though most authorities say he was 90. That's an ancient source saying most authorities say he was 90. And you're thinking, okay, give me 10 minutes and we'll be done. Because this is one of the most important parts. Because what happens is he leaves a legacy of female philosophers. What? Theano, his wife, was a co-philosopher. She was? They're a team. You got that? We always think of Pythagoras. No, it's a team. Born to Crotona around 546 BC, Theano was a daughter of Brontius, who is both a physician and a devotee of the Orphic Mysteries, and so received a very fine education as a result having a very deep love of mathematics. One day, Pythagoras arrived from Samos to her city and began to attend. Uh, she began to uh, actually attend his various talks. Uh, she found him very compelling, found him very handsome, very mesmerizing. And uh, what happens is they started talking to one another. Uh, now, realizing that they had so much in common, According to the primary sources, Theano fell in love with Pythagoras, and the two were married, despite the fact that he was 36 years older than she was. Together, they had five children, three daughters uh, named Damo, Mia, and Ergonote, and two sons named Mesarchus and Telagus, respectively. Although the sons don't do much in philosophy, which I think is interesting. With her husband, Pythagoras, Theano never ceased to study philosophy and became a powerful philosopher of her own right. While also teaching mathematics, Theano also made sure that each of her children also became a trained philosopher, with all three of her daughters becoming philosophers too. During this time, Theano corresponded with Callisto, discussing, discussing child psychology as well as the virtuous way to raise a family. <laughs> when Pythagoras died, you got to hear this. Theano became the official head of his school of thought. 
And because she had endeavored to make certain her children knew his philosophy well, she was able to quickly spread Pythagorean ideas throughout the Mediterranean. It is her that did this. Now, this is my one quote from a secondary source. Mary Beard writes, after the death of Pythagoras, which occurred at the end of the 6th or the beginning of the 5th century BC, Theano carried on the central school of the order. Just how many daughters she and Pythagoras had is a matter of guessing, but some of them seem to be well-established in records. Women who, as teachers, writers, missionaries, disseminated the philosophy of their parents, unquote. Without, now this is me talking, without Theano, much of the works of Pythagoras would have been lost. Theano wrote a biography on her husband entitled The Life of Pythagoras, excerpts of which survive from quotations by others. Athenaeus, uh, Diogenes Laertes, Iamblichus, and Asueta all referred to both her and her many works. Theano's work on virtue was addressed to Hippodamus, who is the, the famous architect and city planner. He's the one who invented the grid system of blocks that we use today. He, she also wrote a work on cosmology and a work on the theory of numbers. We also have letters in her name, in her work entitled, wow, she's prolific. Yes, she is. How come we don't know about her? In her work, <laughs> Construction of the Universe, Theano asserts the cosmos must be understood mathematically as a construct of simple proportions. For her, the universe was organized into 10 concentric spheres corresponding to the sun, the moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Mercury, Earth, counter-Earth, and the stars. Uh, and it all goes around this fixed central fire. Of course, the fixed stars do not move. According to Theano, the distances between the concentric spheres and the central fire are the same ar ar arithmetic proportions as the interval of the musical scale. Theon's other great work, here he goes, other great work is called the Golden Mean, which of course became the basis for golden geometry. Many believing that she is the first philosopher to publish a work on the topic of the golden mean. Some scholars believe the idea of the golden mean was actually founded in her work on virtue earlier as well. And then, of course, you have the daughter, two of them. You have Damo. Well, Theon ensured the philosophy of Pythagoras continued on, adding her own special variations to his theories regarding the golden mean and the layout of the cosmos, their eldest daughter, Damo, was entrusted with preserving and editing the writings of her father. Diogenes Laertes states, and many say that you philosophize in public, as Pythagoras also used to do, who, when he had entrusted his commentaries to Damo, his daughter, charged her to divulge them to no person out of the house. And she, though she might have sold his discourses for so much money, would not abandon them, for she thought poverty and obedience to her father's injunctions more valuable than gold, and that too, though she was a woman. <laughs> and he basically, she's not going to, she's, so, so now you got the wife is continuing the legacy of, of, of uh, Pythagoras and the daughters entrusted with, with, with making sure the writings are safe. The third century uh, Neoplatonist Iamblichus says that the Pythagoreans specifically gave Damo uh, his uh, treatise on the gods. Uh, Pythagoras composed his treatise on concerning the gods. He received assistance from Orpheus, whereupon indeed the theological treatise is subtitled and, of course, he gives it to uh, his daughter. In character, Dom was described as loyal to her father's teachings and a woman of integrity. When P the Pythagorean school of Croton closed following her mother's death, uh, Damo came to Athens, becoming one of those described as the Athenian strangers. Here, two others uh, also came from Croton to help Damo. 
Uh, there's another one. And now, of course, Mia was a younger sister, was her younger sister. And obviously, Mia was the daughter of Pythagoras and, uh, and Theano. And like her older sister, she was trained as a philosopher by both parents. Well, Dava growing up was more the quiet intellectual type, pouring over her books. And Mia was more playful, <laughs> loving music, and was a choir leader at, as, a, as, as a girl. Also, unlike Damo, who, choose to, who chose to stay single, <laughs> Mia wanted to get married and have a family. Uh, she fell in love with this athlete by the name of Milo of Kraton, a, a famous wrestler. Uh, and he was not just any wrestler, uh, having won seven crowns at the Pythian Games at Delphi, <laughs> uh, 10 at the Isthmian Games, and nine at the Nemean Games. Uh, ever since he was a child, Mila was able to lift a bull on his own to keep up his strength. He reportedly had two, 20 pounds of meat, 20 pounds of bread, and 18 pints of wine every day. <laughs> According to one story, Mia met Milo after he saved her father's life when a roof was about to collapse upon him. The two then fell in love, they got married, and they had a family. Scholars, now guess what she does? Does she write? Yeah, she writes too. But what does she write? She writes how to take, you can't make this up here, uh, how to take care of your baby the Pythagorean way. <laughs> what? Yeah, uh, how to take care, you know, so uh, how to apply Pythagorean's ideas to motherhood. Uh, so, so, uh, so here's my advice. She actually goes, <laughs> she goes into this, she talks about every, okay, here he goes. Um, the gold mean is important for a newborn baby. Uh, so every need of the baby needs to be applied to moderation, not too little or too extravagant, for one does not wish to spoil the child nor neglect them. She argues that the baby is naturally inclined to moderation. <laughs> not all babies, right? Uh, so do not under or overfeed them. Barely dress the child or swathe them too much so that they're overheated. If one can afford a nurse, make sure that this person is also of moderate nature not prone to spoil or neglect. The baby's environment must be accorded with harmony in all things. I even have here a how to breastfeed the Pythag Pythagorean way. So, so what she's doing is while older sisters is more, you know, applying to more abstract theories, younger sisters going, hey, let's make this practical to a family life. And you're, so uh, as she became older, she became a little, uh, a little more serious, serious and she did write some other works uh, one word, one word is called in praise of a fly. <laughs> then all of a sudden we have, and I, and I, I am out of time, but I just, I'll just, I'll just mention a few names and, and dance off into the dawn. Uh, then of course, what will happen is a whole parade of all these other female philosophers. You have Eric Note from all 500 BCE. Uh, and, uh, she, uh, she wrote, uh, very interested in the mysteries related to Demeter and Dionysus wrote a collection discussing them and other mysteries in general called the Sacred Narrative. Uh, she also wrote on Attilistai and all these other kinds of cool stuff. Uh, there's, a, there's a fragment of the Sacred Discourse that's still around. Then you have another one uh, from the 5th century BC known as Brotilia, another female Pythagorean uh, philosopher. Uh, you have Asera of Lucinia, uh, another one. Uh, and she writes, human nature seems to me uh, to provide a standard of law and justice both for the home and for the city. Uh, in essence, Asera believed the answer to understanding outward morality as with natural law within nature. One must focus on understanding our inherent human nature. For here, within this microcosm, one can then understand the macrocosm of the universe. And then, then she... This, she's she's from the fourth century. Uh, uh, she's from the fourth century BC. Next, she actually divides the soul into three parts, being threefold. It the soul is organized in accordance with triple functions: that which affects judgment and thoughtfulness is the mind; that which affects strength and ability is the high spirit; and that which affects love and kindliness is desire. 
Hence, the tripartite soul is mind, which is judgment uh, and thoughts connected with the rational principle, spirit, which is courage and strength connected to the mathematical principle, and desire, which is love and friendliness connected with the functional principle. All three aspects of the soul must be balanced with one another, with one reigning in the other. This is really a beautiful philosophy. One, for example, we may desire to do something, but our knowledge may discern what the possible benefits and problems may be encountered if the desire is permitted to move to its fullest extent. So it's basically a moderation between all three of these forces makes for a happy life. And then you have Fintus of the 4th century wrote a whole bunch of works on how to apply Pythagorean ideas. That's a whole page that I'm not going to read. Uh, and then you have Timarchus of Sparta in the 4th century, yet another, and Melissa in the 200s, and Ptolemaeus of Cyrene, uh, and on and on and on. Wow. <laughs> All I can say is, there is a lot here. So, when I say, and I do, that Pythagorean uh, ideas inspired uh, a whole movement of women I didn't exaggerate. This is not modern deconstructionism. This is not revisionism. This is not reverse feminism. This is not any of this. I gave you a talk, the majority of which, except for the, the, the Mary Beard quote, the majority of which is based upon the ancients interpreting Pythagoras for themselves. From there, we as scholars can understand it from a modern perspective. But I want to leave it within this ancient milieu. But even from the ancient perspective, it started this whole movement of women that women can be philosophers just like their male counterparts and do and write exactly the same kind of works and from within their circles be just as respected. So what happened? Unfortunately, this legacy continued on against the late antiquity. antiquity. We do know uh, that these ideas uh, continue into Alexandria. Hypatia of Alexandria also connects to these Pythagorean ideas. You know, the one that was killed, uh, you know, by the various Christians. Yes, that. So, but, so that's kind of what happened. <laughs> So, so, so what I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to communicate here is, is that with the advent of Christianity and the, the, the forcing of patriarchy, the female philosopher of antiquity, especially in these Pythagorean circles, go away. We lose this. It's gone. So here I am, a voice crying in the wilderness, telling you that we need to know, we need to have this information. Pythagoras, I don't always agree with everything Pythagoras says, but at the same time, there are so many ideas that I do agree with. And um, I will leave you with this. I think that we are all equal. Male female, or other, everyone is absolutely equal, and that we should learn to apply the kind of friendship espoused by Pythagoras within our own circles, and also maybe see the world in a beautiful, united way, plants and animals the earth itself, and see this as a grand orchestration of absolute beauty and perfection, even mathematical bliss, and commune within it and celebrate the celebration, so celebrate the, this, 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 this uh, view of, of life uh, that animates all things. I don't know. That's just me. Uh, that's my perspectives. Uh, but I think that uh, learning about the, the mysteries of Pythagoras 
maybe not so mysterious anymore. I think I revealed quite a bit and more than you expected. We don't understand all the mysteries, but we certainly understand enough to know that absolutely Pythagoras was a very important figure in antiquity and even today. Thank you so much. I'm done. Oh. Oh. <laughs>